Hi, this is Travis Walker. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to our podcast. Uh, it's a, an honor and privilege to provide information with regards to the legal work that we're doing here at the law offices of Travis R. Walker and some of the projects, cases, practice areas that we're working on. And I'm so grateful today to have Noel Thomas here today. He is a friend and a uh, colleague. He's also uh, heavily involved in stopping human trafficking across the country. And he's got a, a great company he's working with and owns, and they're doing great work on identifying um, the bad guys and uh, everything we can. And here at the Law Offices of Travis R. Walker, we're working actively also. One of our two uh, biggest visions is uh, one, to help restore the Everglades, but then also uh, to stop human trafficking. And it's a huge problem with huge mm -hmm. consequences for uh, terrible amounts of people. And I'm so glad that you're doing the work that you're doing. I know we saw uh, Tim Tebow at, his, yeah. uh, at the event up in Atlanta talking about how to eradicate um, this, uh, this problem as much as possible. And, you know, I guess, you know, we'll just get started and dive right into it. I, I know you're, you're involved with the company Dark Watch, right? That's it. And uh, what, what, is, what is that company and what do they do? So I'm, I'm very excited about this technology. It's geared towards 30 industries that help facilitate human trafficking, sometimes knowingly and unknowingly. And we're basically creating the Better Business Bureau seal of counter trafficking, where we go into the businesses, we audit their processes and how they think about human trafficking, giving them the tools to actually fight back against these human traffickers. Wow. So like, what, would, what is an example? So there's 30 industries, like just rattle off a few of the industries. Sure. So hospitality is, is one of the big uh, offenders uh, for facilitating human trafficking. And just to give you an anecdotal story, I was doing a raid in Orlando with Metropolitan Bureau of Investigation. And um, when we went out on this raid, the front desk clerk had actually tipped off the trafficker that a raid was going down. Really? And so sometimes uh, uh, these hotels will actually be working and facilitating trafficking or giving them tips and definitely have uh, constructive notice, as you would use in legal terms, sure. of, of knowing that trafficking is occurring. So hospitality airlines, commercial real estate, banking and finance are just a few of the industries that are touched by it, agriculture as well. Yeah. And is it, I guess it's, it's a lot of information that's out there that people don't even know about. People talk about the dark web, they talk about all this different stuff or whatever. And, and, you know, these people, I guess they, they feel like, uh, they, they want to, there's a networking of almost for people who are, um, I don't want to call them Johns, but basically they are sex buyers, right? right. And like, so they talk to each other like, hey, this is a place to go. This is a place, this is whatever, right? And that's that's kind of a lot of, a lot of the information out there, right? That's exactly right. So, I mean, this is also on the open web. So you can go to, to review sites like Yelp and Google, and you can see that people are talking about receiving these types of services in these places right out there in the open. And so once you start seeing them, you start realizing that in our backyards, we've got a few of these places that are often operating in plain sight. Yeah. And I think that that was one of the misconceptions that I had, that human trafficking only occurs overseas or it's only in these emerging countries that don't have you know law enforcement and this sort of thing. But the reality is, is it happens in every community and affluent community to, to poor communities. It, it doesn't matter. Um, all are susceptible to the, the hooks of, of human traffickers. Yeah, I mean, and you touch on it, you know, I, th I think, you know, we all have like walked by the CD massage parlors that mm -hmm. like don't have any windows, they're not affiliated with one of the major brands or something like that. And you're like, you know, really what's going on here? There's something really mm -hmm. suspicious. And it's funny because you, like you said, like, some of, just like you leave a Google review for McDonald's, whether they, they did a good service by you with their Big Mac, this guy is saying, hey, I got a sexual service here at like a massage parlor or something like that, right? And so it's like, it's like, it's that blatant and that open and they think it's okay. And I just I mean, thankfully, they're kind of like red flagging everything for you, right? Oh, that's exactly right. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that these women that work in those facilities are often labor traffic. They don't have freedom of movement. Their passports are taken. Mm. They don't speak the language. And they're often kept in sometimes in the back of these facilities that they're actually living in these facilities. And so that's awful. I think that there's this misconception that they're of their own you know, volition doing this, but the, the truth couldn't be further from that. And, and oftentimes these places are connected to, to organized crime and, sure. and other types of, of crime activities like money laundering and sometimes drugs and, and other crime types. Yeah, so the, the cartels are involved and it goes deep, right? I mean, That's cause, exactly right. Because like the, the cartels, whether they're involved with drugs or whatever else, they're always looking at uh, other revenue streams, just like almost any legit business would. 
okay, the drugs is doing this, the prostitution is doing this, the trafficking here, you know, whatever gambling, it, this is just another revenue stream for illegal activity. That's it. So it's a $150 billion a year industry globally. Insane. And it fuels cartels, it fuels terrorists, organized crime. Yes. And you're right. They do see this as another vertical to make money, uh, just like they would drugs, weapons, cyber scamming. Um, but what's unique about human trafficking is that unlike drugs and, and weapons, it's so loud online. And like we said earlier, it's often in plain sight that it creates a, an incredible opportunity for law enforcement to go after these criminal groups based on what they're posting online. But it also opens up the opportunity for the legal landscape and, and uh, lawfare uh, against these you know, organizations that have been typically exploiting them. Yeah, I mean, and that's obviously one of the things we do. We're, we're actively involved here is doing contingency mm -hmm. work on behalf of victims going after the bad guys because it's one thing to go after them criminally, but like even here, obviously, a big case here in South Florida and the Treasure Coast was the, uh, the Robert Kraft case. The owner of the Patriots was uh, uh, frequenting a massage parlor in Jupiter. Obviously, his lawyers were very crafty and were able to get the things dropped and everything, but there was a huge... It was like a wow this is happening mm -hmm. in our backyard here and that was a big eye-opener for me it's like it, billionaires and you know it's it's often you know white affluent guys who are like spending money on mm -hmm. trafficking you know or, or massage parlors and sex and everything and it's just it's it's mind-blowing that it's just happening in your backyard um so like when did when did dark when did your company get started and what it you know how was what was the genesis of it and all that yeah so um it started actually you know with our family we were in a flea market here locally and uh my dad was bumped by a lady and he looks down and my sister is gone so a uh, a man was walking out the door with my sister and thankfully my dad was able to interdict him before he left with my sister and wow. so we had an incredibly fortunate uh story here but now knowing what i know is not all families end up in that same way and so i think that left an early impression in my psyche on this issue of sure. human trafficking fast forward um overseas with an internationally touring rock and roll band i get this flyer on human trafficking and i learned that there's 32 million people that are enslaved around the world and I thought, you know, I have to see this firsthand to really wrap my mind around this idea. So I go to India and I see this 14 year old girl that's being trafficked and um, it's right above a, a law enforcement agency's you know, headquarters and they're helping facilitate the traffic and this deal. And I thought, you know, this poor girl has no one. Her parents probably sold her into trafficking and now law enforcement is helping you know, facilitate this trafficking. And it was at that time, as cliche as it sounds, uh, that quote from Edmund Burke that says, all it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. And so that started the genesis. I started a nonprofit. I then was the statewide anti-trafficking coordinator in Florida, working with safe houses, setting up appropriations, going out on these raids. And I saw that there wasn't a lot of technology to get after the problem of human trafficking. And yes. so... That's where the idea started to percolate, and um, and now we've created a whole company, and, and an industry is emerging to fight human trafficking technologically. That's amazing, and, and and we talk about technology and AI and all of these tools, and you know, there's always this like, how are we going to mm -hmm. use it, and is it good, is it bad? Right. But you're obviously using it in a great way, and then to to use that technology to to really fight that, and obviously it hits home hard for you to have your family go through that. I met your sister. She's a wonderful person. I'm so glad she never had to experience that terrible thing. And the, and, and yeah, I mean, internationally, it's a, a huge issue. And, but even like we talk about here, it's in the States, it's a, a huge problem. And just trying to figure out, you know, what we can do to do it. I mean, we, you know, hopefully we can start to create some momentum. There's, you know, there's a lot of litigation going on. You know, we talked before we got started about Red Roof Inn. They had like a review online saying, hey, this, there's a brothel here. So they had that constructive notice like you mentioned, and they're opening themselves up to liability. So if we if we can hit them criminally, but if we can hit them in the wallet too, and then create a precedent for it, I think that goes a long way. And you know, they then they start then what's the flip side of that? They start to create standard offering procedures and policies. Like if you see this, call it out. Don't you know? If you got, I know this uh, this is not a G rated podcast, but you got thirty condoms in the used condoms mm -hmm. in the trash can. You know, you know. Uh, housekeeping please let us know that type right. of thing you know 
So is that what you, where you see this going or how do you see this progressing? That's exactly right. So, I mean, working in tandem with strategic litigation and mass tort, we're creating a standard of care for, for the market. So right now it's been a lot of plausible deniability uh, or looking the other way as evidence with the Yelp case. And, you know, another anecdotal story, we were talking to this large dating company and we said, Hey, we've got data on sex traffickers, wouldn't you like to know that uh, for your platform? And they said, uh, no, that's okay. Prostitutes need love too. Prostitutes need love. That's their response and how these companies have been thinking about the issue of human trafficking until recently with the case with uh, Deutsche Bank paying out 75 million in the, the Epstein case mm -hmm. and uh, JP Morgan paying out 290 million. Yep. Uh, the Red Roof Inn case, $29 million. And oh, by the way, there wasn't a lot of uh, survivors that were represented. So these payouts were enormous uh, per, per victim. So the standard of care for the market has been so low. The threshold has been look the other way or don't care or it's happening or even facilitating it in, in the case of the raid that I was on. Sure. And so our idea is to bring uh, a higher level of integrity to these brands, you know, no brand actually, you know, legitimate brand wants to be the brand of human traffickers. No. Right? So uh, we want to equip consumers to decide, hey, our family is going to stay at the hotel that decides to do the most to keep our family safe and fight back against human traffickers. And we're bringing those tools both technologically and through training and consulting um, to help these brands actually keep their customers safe and raise that bar of integrity for the entire market. Well, that's, I mean, that's huge. I mean, obviously, the, the, a lot of big brands are always trying to stay on top of what's mm -hmm. going to be positive for my brand. And so that's a huge thing if, like, they're actively fighting it and they're showing you evidence mm -hmm. that they are. And they're not getting tainted because their competitors are not doing the right thing. And they're getting in the news because they're getting big judgments against them for, for not doing the right thing. I think that goes a long way to, to what you're talking about and finding a way to, to really bring to attention um, how, how bad it is and how there's opportunities to, um, to work in that direction. And, you know, we're, we're obviously, like I said, we're actively litigating these cases. We want to, we want to take these guys to court and everything. And it's just a matter of, you know, trying to find, um, the best avenues possible. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, like you said, the red roof end case or the, um, you know, the other thing, you know, one of the things that we taught, and there's a lot of em illegal immigrants here. And we talked mm -hmm. a little bit before we got started about a pathway for them to be here. So they feel safe about bringing yeah. their case. But also I think we, and we talk about this is we talk about banks, we talk about hotels and motels, but social media, mm -hmm. like Snapchat and Instagram is like a breeding ground for traffickers to like pick up young girls to put them into slavery. And those social media companies, they need to be aware that their platform is a channel trafficking. And is that something like you, you feel you see on the horizon too? Absolutely. So there's, you know, federal regulation that uh, is now allowing victims of trafficking to sue the platform that facilitated their trafficking. Um, and so nice. you are seeing these lawsuits come out. Uh, recently, Pornhub had uh, just paid out for a sex trafficking case that was brought out against them. Um, so there is starting to become precedent for platforms that help facilitate human trafficking. Uh, Meta and most of the other social media companies are under lawsuit right now for sex trafficking charges. Uh, we're also seeing Salesforce tang tangentially uh, being sued for facilitating human trafficking or, or supposedly uh, facilitating human trafficking. So I think that we're going to see a lot more social media companies and other companies that you wouldn't normally think as being involved in human trafficking, being brought these, these suits against them. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's a exciting times uh, to see the market start to change, but, but really the impact of, of these lawsuits and, and technological tools is that we're, we're changing history. Yes. We're, we're, we're seeing a reduction of modern day slavery, which is just as horrific uh, as it ever has been in, mm -hmm. in the course of history. No, and it's huge. And, and I think it, what we key in is that mindset, right? So we talked about Red Roof Inn or like that Orlando rage you're on where they, the front desk tipped off the right. people. So it's like the, the mindset was like, if uh, I don't tip them off, we may lose money. Or if I don't mm -hmm. allow trafficking in my hotel, we may lose money. But if we change it to you are open to liability and a big judgment against you and you're going to lose a lot of money because you're allowing this to happen, we can change that mindset, then we can be like, okay, well, I can't allow trafficking because I may lose money, which of course is a terrible way to like weigh this out. 
but unfortunately that's what some people are doing um you i mean you know the the vast majority of people i think would uh, abhor trafficking but i think there are but if we can hit the, the wallets there and that's why getting a getting a hold of these social media platforms and changing that mindset is is huge and then obviously a lot of the money that can be generated also would be used for education and remedying the effects right that's exactly right. And I think that it's going to take a lot more of these lawsuits to change the mindset, you know, from mm -hmm. that dating company that we talked to of, you know, uh, even seeing it as prostitution versus forced labor or sex trafficking that's occurring here. And so uh, there is a huge education component to how we think about the problem yep. um, as it exists. But I think these litigation, this litigation and lawsuits is going to continue to drive hope and freedom, uh, not only giving a fresh start to, to the victims that have been trafficked, but again, raising that standard of care for the entire market. Um, so it's very exciting times to be to be part of this. Yeah, and, it's, and I think it's, it's getting on the radar because, you know, I think Germany's made a big push for this recently. Um, you know, I went to Davos and I was talking with some, some C-suite executives there and they, it's on their radar from compliance purposes because they don't know what they're hiring people are doing. And, and, you know, if you own a manufacturing facility that's resourcing stuff from Africa or Asia, you don't know sometimes what what's going on for your resources. Right. And so now they're creating compliance departments because of legislation and the lawsuits so that, you know, now they're saying, OK, we have not only do we need to do this for our brand, but like we're going to have legal issues, mm -hmm. too. Right. Is that what you're kind of seeing across the country? Absolutely. And I think you're touching on it. It's not just the sex trafficking angle or. Uh, companies that are involved in facilitating sex trafficking that are liable. It's also on the labor trafficking side, and there's a lot of regulation. You mentioned Germany. Um, California also has regulation for supply chain transparency. Canada has just pa passed some, and over in the UK, they have the Modern Slavery Act. Yeah. And so you're seeing this global regulation that is forcing a change in the behavior, both on the sex trafficking side and the labor trafficking side. Um, and so I think we're going to continue to see that. And of course, there's there's other elements of trafficking. They're looking for new categories, uh, sports trafficking, where individuals are labor trafficked to play sports. Wow. Uh, you've, of course, got organ trafficking as another form of, of human trafficking. So um, there's also these these other types of human trafficking that will touch other industries that yes. weren't previously thought of as well. Yeah. And it, I've practiced law for 17 years now or so. And the one thing, uh, I've, you know, obviously there's a lot of, there's always lawyer jokes. There's always like this stigma against lawyers, particularly trial lawyers. You know, they talk about the McDonald's coffee case and like how the lady spilled coffee mm -hmm. in her lap. Mm -hmm. Of course, they never talk about the fact that she had third degree burns in her crotch area. But they, and, but like, they also don't talk about things like the Ford Pinto, like mm -hmm. the, the, when they used to like, and Ford took the time and they're like, Hey, we either have the opportunity to fix this with a, a, a small fix or we allow these cars to continue to drive on the road. And then when they get rear-ended, they begin to go into flames. And they made this, they made a, a, a profit decision right. that said, we're just gonna allow these cars to continue to stay on the road because it's not worth what it's gonna fix, what we anticipate. Obviously, trial lawyers got involved. We got punitive damages against mm -hmm. them many, many years ago. And so there is a lot of value to bringing this litigation. And one of the things that I pride myself in with regards to being a lawyer is we have the opportunity to do the right thing make a living in the pro in the aspect of course but you're helping people and changing the course of history you're changing mm -hmm. culture you're changing um, corporate policy by doing this litigation and getting involved in so that's why i'm so uh, excited to be partnering with you with regards to it and everything that you're doing and then i mean it's just is there what what are some other misconceptions about trafficking that you think that people have yeah, I think I think that uh, there's a lot of misconceptions. Again, the misconception that I had that it only occurs in other countries and it's not in our backyard. And as you pointed out, we've had raids that have occurred literally in our, our backyard. And so I think that's part of it. I think there's a lot of misconceptions on, you know, what trafficking and modern day slavery looks like. It's mm. constantly evolving and becoming more sophisticated. Uh, there's these complex romance scams that are occurring out of uh, Asia where these women are kept in these scam compounds and uh, they'll have phones from floor to ceiling that they are engaging in relationships with individuals here in the U.S. And so you've now got a victim on victim crime. Oh, my gosh. 
where you're not actually getting after the trafficker themselves and they're they're meeting on these dating websites the you know the the dating companies that look the other way now they have a real problem where these scams are actually uh affecting uh users and so that's just kind of the nature of where trafficking goes and uh, you're also seeing uh, more of a push online uh, into streaming video and, and other abuse types that that occur online uh, because you get broader reach and uh, and less uh, you know visibility in public and so wow. I think um, I, I think people don't realize just how sophisticated human trafficking can be but even when they become more sophisticated they're still touching the internet service providers, they're still touching the social media platforms, and there's still many uh, companies that are involved in, in making that transaction happen, even though it's not occurring yes. in the physical world. Wow. No, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing to, to see the impact and the, the effect of it and just trying to figure out you know, what, what can be done. What is, what is a way that you think like an, an average person who's listening to this podcast, they can raise the awareness of, of the human trafficking and, and what they can do? I mean, you and I probably drive down a turnpike and, you know, because we're, we're like trying to fight trafficking, we're constantly, I see the poster there, I see a poster in the airport, whatever, you know. Right. But like from a, an average citizen perspective, what do you think some of the things they could do would be? You know, I, I always say that it's important to start with a conversation, a conversation like we're having today, a yep. conversation with your, your children. Um, but also, you know, a lot of your listeners might be within one of the 30 industries that human trafficking touches. And so it's important to have that conversation in the workplace. Do we have policies and procedures? Have we done corporate training around this, uh, this concept of, of human trafficking? But as simple as having a conversation in your home of, you know, talking to your children about the dangers of, of social media and yeah. online gaming and yeah. And the opportunities the, to create a trusting and safe environment uh, that if they see anything online or approached in kind of a weird way, that they can have a safe outlet to discuss that is so important. And then a, a conversation with our, our local and federal politicians, mm -hmm. you know, is that this needs to be a top priority. Human trafficking is the largest that it's been, ever been in history, more lucrative than it ever has been in history and now is the time for us to take a historical stand yes. against human trafficking and so wow. we say that the average person can start by engaging in conversation amazing yeah i mean it's, it's a big part of it because you know i have a nine-year-old daughter a 15 year old mm. son and, and both of them but obviously particularly my nine-year-old daughter it's like you know obviously i would i would die for her i would kill for her i would maim whoever i needed mm -hmm. to to get to protect her and so the idea that there's these these predators on these social media sites that she may be on at some point in her time is is just horrifying mm -hmm. and but it's a reality and we have to uh, face that reality and i think that people should educate themselves educate their kids have that conversation if they hear something say something bring it to law enforcement you know if you're if you have somebody who's using some of these brothels you know bring it to the proper authorities and you know it's it's just it's it's a really rough go of it and uh, you know, but I know that that's one of the great things that Dark Watch is doing is that you, you guys are identifying these bad guys. And I don't want you to go into your trade secrets and everything else like that. But it's it's basically you're like able to identify these bad places. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like and then you're able to figure out what to do next. Right. And then help companies and then help just overall. Right. That's it. And so, uh, you know, I've given a lot of examples of companies that have purposely look the other way, but a lot of them are unknowingly uh, facilitating human trafficking and, and they want to do the right thing. And so um, we're giving a, them a way to scan their customer bases and scan the internet and geographies to, to see if they're in these corridors of human trafficking risk and, right. and how to create a comprehensive 360 degree view of the risk of human trafficking and attack it by creating training and policies and procedures, a reporting method, um, some simple things that can can greatly reduce the chance of human trafficking for the businesses that do want to do the right thing, you sure. know, that aren't actively being paid off by traffickers to, to look the other way or, or just don't care. Um, so that that's where we're maybe most excited about to bring this solution is to those businesses that are joining in what we're calling the Dark Watch Alliance nice. of businesses uh, globally that are saying, hey, you know what, uh, you're not going to commit human trafficking on our property. 
uh, or through our technology. And almost like a seal of approval, like That's we're it. dark watch, we're part of that dark watch community, we're doing the right thing. So I, I foresee like commercial, large commercial landlords or mm -hmm. Marriott or I don't know, different large hotel chains where they have your software, your technology, and then they can say, because even the even the franchisee or like Marriott, because right. a lot of the hotels are owned by a franchisee, is potentially liable. Mm -hmm. And I don't want my brand tainted by that if I'm Marriott. Mm -hmm. And so I say, hey, you know, like I'm gonna use your software. We're gonna look across all of our different hotels. And then as soon as something pops up, we're on it, right? Yeah. So that would be big. Absolutely. And you, you mentioned uh, uh, the reputation risk of, of having human traffickers engaging with your brand. You know, we all know um, what a reputation hit can, can do. We recently saw, um, you know, Bud Light use, lose over a billion dollars um, by a reputation hit. And these other companies that have had reputation hits that literally cost them billions of dollars in name alone. And really no brand wants to be known as the brand of human traffickers. I mean, that is not good for your... It's not good for business. It's not good for your business and it's not good for your reputation. And it's not good for your soul. I, I, I think mm -hmm. deep down, you know, when it comes down to a humanistic part of it. And yeah, like you, like you said, Bud Light or, or any of these other large companies, they didn't even do anything illegal. Right. And they got a huge billion dollar hit. Right. Like you're, if you're associated with trafficking, you're, I mean, you're looking at some huge problems. That's exactly right. And then, I mean, you're, you're splashing all over the news. Families are not wanting to stay at your hotel. Um, eventually you start losing users on your, your social media platform or gaming platform because it becomes an unsafe environment and, and that reputation starts to, to really stick. And then of course your competitors are going to do the right thing and you know they're they're going to start putting the proper safeguards in in place and, and publicly not acknowledging this we're seeing this in the uk under the modern slavery act a lot of companies will actually post their pledge and the policies and procedures that they're taking in the fight against human trafficking wow us hasn't quite got there yet and, and still is very kind of quiet people don't want to talk about human trafficking or it's a bit taboo but yeah in the next three to five years, we'll see companies that are actively out there saying, hey, you know what? We are proud to be in the fight against human trafficking. We're going to be stand on the right side of history on this and, and fight back against trafficking. I love it. I love it. I love what you're doing. And I mean, I guess, and then just to sum up everything we're talking about, I guess, is there, if someone wanted to have some more, more information about Dark Watch and what you do and, and, and all that type of stuff, what would be a good way for them to learn more about Dark Watch? Uh, they can go to darkwatch.io. Um, I have a book that I got published that will be coming out, Dark Traffic. Nice. You can find that on Amazon or Barnes & Noble Yes, uh, that comes out in July. And you can learn a lot about the underbelly of organized crime involved in, uh, in human trafficking and the sophistication uh, that they operate under. So, wow. That's yeah. mind-blowing. And, and it's just, it's, you're such a wealth of information. I'm so glad that you're here and taking the time with us. And thank you for your time. Thank you for what you do for mm -hmm. Our community, our country, the world, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're making a huge impact. And, you know, I tell my staff all the time, it's like, we could do anything we want for a paycheck, but if we can make a living and we can make the world a better place, that's that's the golden ticket. Um, so, you know, here at the Law Center, Travis R. Walker, we do the human trafficking litigation. We're, you know, working with partners like Dark Watch to make things uh, better and to, to hold accountable those who don't want to be, do the right thing. They want to, you know, try to figure out a way around um, the way to do the right thing. And so we're here to hold them accountable and we're happy to do it. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thanks, Travis. You're a great guy. It's good seeing you. Good seeing you. Take care, man. Thanks. Yep.